Well, there's a cyclical nature to the de development and deployment of next generation PV technologies. And in 2022, it appears that the transition to N-type is underway. Both incumbent and emergent, emerging manufacturers are adopting N-type at scale, but there are still many questions as to when the technology will move into the mainstream of PV project development. Hello and welcome to this Deploying High Efficiency session at Roundtables Europe 2022. I'm Jonathan Gifford, the Editor-in-Chief of PV Magazine Global, and I'm joined by PV Magazine Editor Mark Hutchins. Hi, Mark. Thanks, Jonathan. Coming up in this session, we'll take a look at recent trends in silicon PV manufacturing and share details of Ryzen Energy's latest heterojunction module and how the company is scaling up this technology to keep those efficiency and energy yield figures going up. Uh, after that, I'll be having a quick chat about Topcon technology with Jinko Solar's Roberto Murgioni, uh, short for Tunnel Oxide Passivated Contact. Topcon is another N-type technology that's rapidly scaling up this year and becoming ever more affordable as it goes. Then we head into this session's main panel discussion, in which we'll cover the high efficiency technologies moving closer to the manufacturing mainstream this year, and some of the issues that could still slow down or disrupt this transition. After several years of market dominance for P-type PERC modules, N-type technologies, chiefly but not only Topcon and Heterojunction, are reaching scale and set to take a much bigger market share than ever before. Here to tell us more about this trend and some of the movements behind it is Molly Morgan, research analyst at UK-based technology specialist Exowatt. Molly, welcome. Uh, and how do you see this transition in technology playing out over the next few years? Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'll, I'll dive straight into telling you about the history and future of PV technologies. So over the past decade, the PV industry has transitioned from a cost reduction era to a performance improvement era. And in the cost reduction era, which lasted up until around 2015, the cost of modules fell sharply, but the efficiency didn't increase by much. And this cost reduction was driven mostly by decreases in the cost of materials. And then from 2015 onwards, in the performance improvement era, cost reductions were harder to achieve, so the industry instead turned to focus on increasing module efficiencies. The PV industry is currently dominated by P-type monopirc cells, but as monopirc reaches its efficiency limits, the, in the industry must turn to other technologies to further improve module efficiency and hence reduce the cost of energy at the system level. So this is where N-type technologies come into play. So N-type, Topcon and Heterojunction can both offer higher efficiencies in comparison to monopirc. And this graph that I'm showing you here is an extract from Exawatt's quarterly module tracker, which is a survey of publicly available module data sheets. And here each point represents a module series with the yellow representing the average and the X's representing the maximum efficiency of a given technology. And you can see that Topcon and Heterojunction have higher maximum efficiencies than monopirc for the modules currently in our data set. Between Topcon and Heterojunction, Exawatt believe it's currently too early to pick a winner in terms of efficiency. And this is partly due to the number of different cell architectures within each technology. But aside from efficiency gains over monopirc, Topcon and heterojunction also offer the following benefits, which are higher bifaciality, reduced but not eliminated light-induced degradation, improved temperature coefficients, and improved low-light performance. So when I give you all those benefits, the question is, why has the transition not yet happened? So the previous PV industry transition from multi-BSF to monopirc occurred when the comparatively more efficient monopirc achieved cost parity with multi-BSF at the module level, which allowed monopirc to win on cost at the system level. So the transition to N-type will happen in the same way when the more efficient N-type technologies can be manufactured without a cost premium compared to monopirc. Exawatt models manufacturing costs for best-in-class integrated manufacturers, and based on a bottom-up cost modeling approach, Exowatt has been predicting that Topcon would approach manufacturing cost per watt parity with monopirc in the 2023 to 2025 timeframe. 
And whilst heterojunction can also offer efficiency gains in comparison to monoperc, um, and you can see that on the graph on this slide here, heterojunction currently lags behind Topcon in the race to achieve low cost manufacturing. So despite N-Type's cost premium over Monoperc, this hasn't stopped a number of N-Type capacity announcements over the last year. And the graph here shows that the currently announced Topcon and Hetch Junction expansions are clearly dominated by China at the moment. Several existing major manufacturers are moving heavily into Topcon, for example, Jollywood and Jinko. And one reason established manufacturers might choose to opt for Topcon over heterojunction is due to the ability to upgrade existing perk cell lines to Topcon, whereas heterojunction requires entirely new cell lines. But on the other hand, and also from a manufacturing perspective, heterojunction has a comparatively simpler manufacturing process, which typically involves fewer manufacturing steps, depending on how you look at it. Um, and in the future, we expect these numbers um, sort of for 24, 2024 to be pushed up as more capacity plans are announced. As, as it mentions here, this is only the currently announced manufacturing expansion plans. And we expect the numbers to be pushed up for both Topcon and Hetch Junction in the future. So we know the transition to N-Type is coming and we've seen the evidence in terms of capacity plans, but there's also the question of what will happen even further down the line after the transition to N-Type. And Exwat believe that in the late 2020s or early 2030s, it's likely to be tandem cells that will drive the PV industry. And there's a lot of uncertainty on what technologies that will involve and what different tandem architectures um, will be used. And for example, you can have perovskite silicon tandem cells but these can offer um, cell efficiencies of over 30%, which translates to a module efficiency of somewhere in the range of 27%. And if you remember back to that slide I showed you earlier, that's a large increase compared to today's heterojunction and Topcon modules, which achieve efficiencies of around 22 to 23%. So that was a quick overview of where we stand today and where Exwat see the industry going in the next 10 years or so. Um, and I hope that's set the scene well for today's talks and get in touch if you want to hear more about Exort's work in PV. Thank you very much, Molly Morgan. Uh, well, now we're going to take a look uh, first at one manufacturer that's going into heterojunction technology. Thanks, Mark. Well, heterojunction PV is hardly a new cell architecture, having been pioneered by Sanyo and then produced by Panasonic throughout the early years of the modern PV industry. But today we're seeing producers in Asia and even here in Europe adopt the technology. And in China, Ryzen Energy was one of the first major Chinese producers to go with HJT and to provide an update as to their progress and, uh, and the company's strategy behind choosing heterojunction. Po Chung Yang prepared this short presentation. He's a general manager, HJT, business unit for Ryzen Energy. Today, I would like to share ultra low carbon footprint and high efficiency hyper ion heterojunction product from Ryzen. My name is Paul Chan Yang, in charge of Hetzel Junction Business Unit in Ryzen. This page is one to show that the advantages of per perfect passivation by amorphous silicon uh, is we can achieve super high open circuit voltage, which is larger than 750 mini volt. Uh, from this patch, as you can see, the open circuit voltage and the recombination current has exponential relationship. That means we can easily achieve even higher open circuit voltage with signal wafer. So in this case, uh, from Q2 last year, we started to introduce 120 micrometer wafer. At the beginning, the efficiency is even lower than using amorphous silicon dot layer. That is because the cell current becomes very low when using thin wafer. After that, we, int we introduce microcrystal silicon doping layer in N layer. And the current is recovered since microcrystal silicon doping layer has lower light uh, absorption coefficient compared to amorphous silicon layer. Next, we introduce microcrystal silicon P layer and keep optimizing N layer. 
recently we achieved even a higher average uh, sale efficiency, which is 25.2%. Uh, Using microcrystal silicon layer, uh, not only current, but also uh, field factor will increase largely due to thicker top layer and better field effect preservation and the smaller serial resistance in solar cell. As you know, head junction is an old technology over 30 years. Why it cannot become mainstream product? This problem is always the cost is too high. This is license latest head junction product hyper ion. Our target is to provide the customer a high CP value and ultra low carbon footprint and the production ready product. There are six features in hyper ion product. The first one is we will use G12 half wafer in order to adapt thinner wafer, which is smaller than 100 micrometer in the future. The second one is 24 bars bar. As you know, the conductivity of low temperature silver past is worse than high temperature silver past. According to our simulation, 24 bars bar is the best design to compromise between electrical and optical consideration in modular level. The third one is we will use a low silver content test, especially at the rear side of the solar cell, which is very similar to the concept of the perk cell. Normally, uh, we will use uh, aluminum pads at the rear side of the perk cell. The fourth one is steel frame. There are two advantages. Uh, the first one is carbon footprint is lower than aluminum frame, and also it is stronger than aluminum material. Number five is a high energy yield, which is coming from Hassel Junction's lowest temperature coefficient and uh, uh, larger than 85% by visuality in module level. The last one is low degradation from double glass module, and uh, there is no LID and no PID effect. Thanks. Well, thank you, Po Chung Young from Ryzen, to take us through the developments in Ryzen's heterojunction technology, which is targeting both efficiency increases and also cost reductions, which is encouraging to see. But of course, heterojunction isn't the only high efficiency technology that's making its way into mainstream production. Topcon, as Mark Hutchins mentioned earlier, and also Molly pointed to, is another contender when it comes to high efficiency production. Let's hear from a producer that's look looking to push push TopCon into the mainstream after this. TopCon cell production is seeing major growth this year. Uh, and China's Jinko Solar is one manufacturer that's already operating several gigawatts of TopCon capacity uh, and has plans for a lot more. We have Roberto Murgioni, Head of Technical Service for Europe at Jinko Solar, here with us today. Roberto, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, Roberto, we just heard from, from one company that's pursuing a heterojunction at scale. Jinko Solar is going down a slightly different route with, with Topcon. Uh, can you tell us what's, what's behind this decision? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, let, let, let's start from two years ago, we started developing our top internal technology, HOT, and now HOT2 technology. Um, because, I mean, already two years ago, we noticed that with PERC technology, we were reaching a high efficiency limit, right? So there is a physical limit that we cannot really improve. And in order to be proactive, we started to dig into um, top technology um, because, I mean, this new technology, is, which is actually not, not really new, it's, it's going to improve the efficiency up to 28, 29%, which gives us a lot of space for the next years to improve this technology and to increase the efficiency of our PV plants worldwide. So... I mean, in, in, in short, we, we want to optimize our sales. We want to optimize our products. And that's why we see the next step in terms of technology evolution of solar PV 
I mean, for utility scales and for commercial, industrial, but also residential, going uh, with n types of transit knowledge. And we're here, and we're here in this session today to talk about high efficiency in in PV. Uh, you mentioned twenty eight point seven, I think, as the as the limit for Topcon. But uh, but uh, where is Jinko at today in terms of cell and module efficiency on on the production line, and uh, and what's on your roadmap in terms of improvements in the next few years? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I have to say that uh, we have really huge plans in terms of production and in terms of efficiency as well. So right right now we have around uh, depending on on the family on the product an efficiency around twenty five percent and uh, even more, and. Um, our target is actually within this year to have a global capacity of uh, 40 gigawatt of top con technology. So we have already a factory running 100% of 16 gigawatt. So we are already we started delivering top con HOT2 technology in February, and we went all in. We we decided we we received an an, an, an impressive feedback from the market. Uh, in terms of acceptance of the technology from institutions, from investors, from banks. That's why we decided to strongly increase our capacity and to move from a pack based technology to top front, faster than we expected as well. Uh, and performance, of course, is, is about much more than just efficiency. Can, can you talk for a moment about the other N-type advantages and, and how these can be optimized even further? Sure. I mean, that's that's an that's an important question. So let's let's analyze first of all why we're going for Topcon. So, I mean, um, you know, there are different entire technology in the market, and one of these technologies definitely also at the junction, which is a, a good technology as well. But I think we have to somehow let me say differentiate the strategy. So we want to make um, anti the standard technology. So we want to also match, we want to go with a price acceptance close to PERC. So we want, we want just to, to, to swap that technology. And that's why we analyze the process efficiency, the cell production. We analyze all the difference between the um, N-type technologies, IBC, Ether Junction, Topcon. And, you know, uh, all of them are very excellent technology, but why we went for Topcon? Well, I mean... At the end of the day, it's, we have to put in a complex matrix, many factors, many inputs. But just to summarize, the final out outcome is that we have to use, if we, if we want to go to at junction, we, we have to use a large consumption for silver paste. And the low temperature silver paste is expensive. So also, you know, it's, it's a matter of equipment investments. I mean, we are speaking about in industrialization process. And in this case, the full compatibility with the existing money factor machines in our lines with Ethereum Junction made us the, very easy to choose the, you know, the, the top one because the cost of that is much higher for Ethereum Junction rather than the top one. And what is bringing top to to the investors, to the market? Well, it's a complete set of benefits. I can um, summarize with uh, some quick, uh, very important points like better warranty conditions in terms of uh, uh, lower degradation, just 1% the first year and 0 04 uh, the following years in terms of percentage. And then we have a much better low light irradiance response from this technology. We have definitely in terms of um, temperature, a, a better response. So the temperature coefficient of this technology, of this product family, is lower, which means the response will be better. So not to mention that we managed to almost eliminate the LID and the LEPID, which is very important in terms of degradation. And there is also a reliability concept because according to the third party test, we realized that for every IAC test, the N-type technology is performing consistently better than D-type. So the all complete set of benefits are bringing to the investors one key factor, which is energy more. And energy more, higher efficiency, low, lower surface in terms of utilization are going definitely to increase the IRR of the investment and reducing the LCOE. And this is our target. 
Thanks, uh, Roberto. Well, we'll move now uh, into, into our panel discussion for the session. Uh, Roberto, please, please stick around. Before that, we'll introduce our three other speakers for the panel. Well, uh, producing high efficiency is one thing, and we've heard a lot about manufacturing trends, manufacturing strategies, and how these high efficiency technologies are going to come into the market, but actually using them in PV projects, either utility scale or rooftop, is another question, but perhaps particularly in utility scale, which is so sensitive to cost structures. So let's now bring a panel of experts together to discuss how high efficiency technologies, whether it be heterojunction, whether it be Topcon, are going to make their way into the European marketplace. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Nicola uh, Schuller, who is a partner at Everos, uh, Roberto Mergionu, who we know from Ginkgo Solar, joining us again, George Talupas, who is a Senior Director of Technology and Quality for Solar and Storage at Clean Energy Associates. Hello, George. And Adona Zocco, the Executive Director, Clean Energy T Technology with IHS Market. Thank you all for joining Roundtables Europe. Thanks. And uh, well, Ad Adona, I think it would be great uh, for you to kick us off. Now, we're, we're starting to see N-type modules already rolling off production lines in, in large numbers. Uh, where do you see modules like these HJT Topcon being deployed initially uh, in terms of region and project type? and thanks for, for the kind invitation. Well, as uh, Roberto was just saying, uh, we are seeing some capacity, especially from certain players, already coming up in the second half of this year. But uh, in our view, uh, it will not be until 2023 when we, uh, 2023 will be really the tipping point for N-type technologies to reach a significant share uh, of, global, of global production. Of course, PERC will still be dominant, but we are anticipating a very quick change of, of cycle from PERC to N-type, as it happened really like a few years ago from BSF to, to PERC. Uh, in terms of where uh, uh, this is going to be or where these modules are going to be um, uh, deployed, uh, we expect early deployment in the DG space. In, uh, in reality, the DG space, uh, residential and, and CNI has been since last year, a major engine of growth for solar in many geographies, uh, China as well as uh, Europe and, and the United States, among other, other regions. Um, and uh, this segment is a bit less price sensitive, or let's say that the, the, the higher prices of modules don't have such a significant impact as in utility, and um, because there is a still a price gap between PERC and, and end-time modules, this is important. Uh, and this is an early uh, stage segment for, for deployment of these, of these modules. And uh, we are also seeing uh, uh, N-type modules being used in utility scale, particularly in China at the moment. And we do expect as more volume becomes available, this trend to also be applied in other international markets. And well, let's, uh, let's pass now to George Talupas. Uh, George, on, on the investor side, do you see customers buying N-type at, at scale already? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we see the first uh, multi-hundred megawatt projects being uh, <coughs> Topcon now. Uh, obviously, very few companies can do that, right? So we know it's a, it's a handful. Um, so it, it's moving to this direction, and definitely Jinko has made a, a big bet here. And there are clear reasons for that. Uh, it has to do with... Uh, the higher efficiency and the balance of system savings and uh, the projected high energy yield so that that leads to uh, lco advantages i think that's that's the main reason that topcon is is chosen over perk <clears throat> so definitely the path is uh, is clear towards high efficiency uh hetero junction will follow probably but we don't know when Okay, thank you for that, George. I was interested to hear Adorno say that at IHS you're expecting the change to happen quite quickly um, as the switch from, uh, from multi-crystalline over to, to mono-perk happened very quickly. Uh, Nicola, I want to bring you um, into the discussion now. We hear a lot about um, um, these kind of performance gains, and in fact, George touched on it just a moment before, um, that can be delivered by these N-type technologies. When you're actually talking and working with in investors and with project developers, how difficult is it to really demonstrate 
uh, that the, these performance gains and how, how much can they be relied on when you're actually developing a project? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, thanks for, for the opportunity to participate. Uh, that's, that's really thrilling to see the deployment, mass deployment of uh, large scale projects with high efficiency. Uh, well, I think the important point that's from, from the first presentation from Molly Morgan, uh, I mean, all those technologies have been existing for many years. So conceptually, we know that they are performing better than uh, what we, we had some years ago. So I'd say the general statement is there's no question about the fact that you've got higher surface um, efficiency. The question comes when, when you have to, to do a bankable EPA. In the end, you need your project to be bankable, to be financed, right? Um, and what we see is a difficulty, but it was already the case with Perkcell. I mean, the, 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 the industry is moving extremely fast. It's highly competitive. Uh, so manufacturers have to come with uh, improvement of their modules all the time. And we sometimes have uh, data for, for the preliminary energy assessment. So prior to construction, uh, sometimes very early stage, still in, in development phase. And you need quite rapidly to define uh, the energy assessment for, for the banks. And on several parameters, sometimes we have doubts because the, the characteristics that are promoted by different manufacturers are based on, on early production, even pre-series batches. And there are key um, aspects of the module performance that in fact are common to any technology like low light response, all those new technologies from PER to top natural junction, even IBC have better response uh, in, in general temperature coefficients. But uh, sometimes the, the characteristic promoted are extremely optimistic and ideally we, we, we like to see uh, figures backed by independent uh, lab reports and here's the difficulty is that sometimes the tests have been performed over a few samples even sometimes only one module and so we have to be a bit cautious about uh, what's what's presented by the manufacturers so so General statement is yes, you can expect uh, better yield, but sometimes it's too good to be true. And uh, yeah, you, you, you have to be cautious on how you assess the, the future efficiency of your system. Well, I suppose real world data is the most important. And Roberto, I'll bring you into the conversation again. Um, George described Jinko's bet on Topcon as a very big bet. Um, are you, from this bet and from this production at gigawatt scale, are you actually getting data from the field? Shall I take this one or, or George? No, no, no. I'm asking this to you, Roberto. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I, I totally agree uh, with the last sentence. Uh, I mean, uh, personally, I've been working as a, I mean, a designer for many times with EPC uh, from investors. And so I, I like the word in conservative. And I like the word in third party, you know, tests. So, what, what Jinko has done uh, is really going towards, uh, of course, uh, real test data. I mean, as, as I specified, we started two years ago collecting data of um, uh, anti topcon technology. I mean, it's, it's not just a case that we are so confident, but we have a big amount of data from test field from different locations, different environment conditions. And, the, and it's true that when we promote uh, 3% energy more, uh, it's, it's purely maybe just one number, which is not given in a real indication because 3%, it's more marketing. I'm a technical person and I have to be honest, but it's also true that at every conditions, at every test that we have done, N-type is always performing better in terms of energy plus and can be 1%, can be 1.5. If we apply by facial, it is going to be even 2, 2.5% up to 3%. This is the correct sentence. And this is why also we have done several third party tests. Like we have just received from TUV, Reinald, the LID test report, which has really, I mean, <laughs> impressive numbers that we can share with our customers because it's, it's very negligible effect. So yeah, I do agree that uh, Antype is a superior technology. And of course you have to make your correct and realistic simulations in order to have your business, I mean, uh, safe. 
that's that's something that I totally agree. Okay, thank you, Roberto. Uh, Adorno, bringing you back into the conversation, looking again at markets. Now, now this is the Roundtable's Europe event. We are very European-focused. Do you think that the European marketplaces in particular will be a focus for um, exports for N-type products or even you know, the small number of domestic producers here who are now starting to become established? But do you think that there will be a pull factor from the European markets for these N-type products as they move more into the mainstream? Yeah, definitely. As I was saying before, uh, we do expect the distribution, the, the markets with a strong distribution generation growth will be, uh, you know, key uh, markets for for this entire product. Of course, you know, any any future attempts of establishing local manufacturing in in Europe as well as in other markets like United States, of course, uh, there will need to be bets for high efficiency products as a as a as a better way. Uh, to, to compete with uh, with uh, production from from other regions, uh, so definitely yes, uh, European uh, markets are a, a key destination. Will be a key destination for N-type uh, modules. Okay, thank you for that, Adorno. Uh, and at this point, I hope we can bring George Talupas into the discussion again. Um, a good place to start is to point out that that these technologies are not entirely new. Uh, heterojunction, in particular, though they are new to to mainstream production. Is, is technology risk still a factor here? Yes, as you said, heterojunction is a 30-year-old technology. Uh, so I think we have a lot of data, but at the same time, we, we see some uh, changes that are being detected. So it's not uh, probably the heterojunction of the future will be slightly different. Topcon is definitely much newer technology. On the other hand, I would say that there is enough track record, even for Topcon, and also that the industry has the tools, the external reliability, external reliability testing tools. Uh, there is also an IC standard to that, uh, that uh, gives us quite good confidence on, on how to deal with Oh, George seems oh, to have frozen. Oh, I think we've lost George there. Just um, for one moment, perhaps Nicola, that's a good chance for you to jump in. Um, reliability testing, technology risk right. when it comes to these new technologies. Oh, no, actually, sorry, George, you're back. You're back. You can continue. <laughs> sorry, mate. Right. The internet is a, is a wobbly thing sometimes. Yeah. So I was saying, yeah, well, the industry has the external reliability testing tools. And there is also an AIC standard. So we know how to test modules. We know what to expect. Uh, I don't think that there are significant reliability concerns for either top or heterojunction. Now, perovskites is a different story, but until then, uh, I think it should be putting too much, too much emphasis on, on reliability, yep. as soon as we do the right things. But can I jump in with a follow-up, George? You know, like, we can say that we have the reliability testing and, you know, these are established technologies, but we also saw with the switch to, from kind of multi to mono perk, then LETID kind of raised its head, something that we didn't know about at all. So it tends to be when, when we are looking at new technologies in production, particularly when the production processes may not be so well established, and different producers are using different technologies or different production processes, that there might be some hidden kind of degradation risks around the corner. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But fundamentally, the technologies are not um, are pretty well researched. They're not that new. I mean, there has been some track record for a few years now. Uh, you know, the pioneer, obviously, uh, Jollywood has, uh, has installations that have been going on for, for a couple of years at least. And there's a lot of testing as well. So I think we have the tools to screen out, let's say, bad modules. Uh, now, XID, where X could be anything, is always a risk. That, that's always be there. Uh, but uh, we, we cannot put too much emphasis on that. Otherwise, we'd all be uh, doing a multi-BSF forever, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have to be brave at one point, I suppose. Yes, always. <laughs> Thanks, George. Uh, and, well, building on this question of technology risk, uh, I think it would be good to ask Nicholas, uh, when it comes to deploying these N-type modules, can we already see bankable energy calculations for, for projects? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, well, we do that, and we already have clients considering uh, Topcon. Um, but I, I insist, I mean, we, we discussed, but N-type has been on the market for, for a long while. Uh, not at very large scale compared to, to what's been perk over the past year, for instance. Um, but it, it's it's been here. The, the main issue to date 
was that manufacturers promoting end type were, were not competing at price. So they were focusing rather on, on other segments like residential or, or small commercial where you've got surface constraint. So, so just jumping on what was said, where is, is Europe the good market for end type? Definitely, because even at utility scale compared to other regions, uh, space is an issue in, in many countries. So, so y yes, you, you, you can do uh, bankable EPAs. Again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an evolution than, than rather than really a, a revolution. Like George just mentioned, perovskite, which needs training only to say the, the name properly. Uh, that is potentially the next big thing, and that will require a lot of, of care and a lot of testing. Compared to, uh, I mean, P-type, N-time, we're to talking about silicon, so, so we've got a lot of return of experience. I, I, I'd like to highlight, uh, well, we were recently involved in project uh, with Jinko. I'm mean, not surprised, it's one of the, the tier one manufacturer. And, and we, we had quite good data. So I'm not saying it because Roberto is on the call, but it, it was an example of, of, to me, the way to proceed. The manufacturer shared uh, uh, test lab results were, were clear on, on what they understood. And, and we've got to have a, an, an honest discussion. You know, there, there's nothing worse than being super pessimistic. And then two years or three years later, the bank comes back to you because the sponsor uh, actually operates the plant and can't pay back the loan. Because because we didn't do the job, so so yeah, you you, you have to be to be careful. So <laughs> sometimes clients complain that uh, we tend TA to be too conservative. Uh, I think yeah, there 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 is to be uh, some middle ground, and and really decision must be taken on what we know and technical uh, some technical decision. And then, as George said, it, it's true that. LET idea appeared and it was something new that I think to date is not totally understood and we have to, to live with that. I mean, it, it's still a, an emerging technology, PVs are consolidations. So one thing is definitely the energy assessment, but the other thing you have to, to, to look into are uh, contractual commitments, warranty, things like that. So it's the project as, as uh, a wall, you know, that you have to, to consider. And it's not only about the energy figures you're, you're putting forward. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, now, now, Roberto, let's let's talk cost a little bit. We we did hear that um, you know N-type technologies aren't going to be competing with P-type on cost. It's not going to be a race to the bottom. But but y you know you've you've spelt out a vision for cost competitiveness for Topcon from Jinko. How, how is that going to be achieved? How, what's what's the secret for Topcon competing on cost in markets like Europe? Yeah, no, no. That's 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 a good one. Okay. So, <clears throat> well, l let me structure this discussion in, in two parts. Let's let's analyze the actual status. So, I mean, price developments. So many things are happening around our industry. I think it's clear. And I mean, eventually, a reshape of expectations, and you know. What, what is going to be, it's, it's, it's something that we have to, to, to apply for. I mean, let's take an example of 2000, H1 2022. I mean, all the more, more important uh, analysts, they predicted, uh, you know, a fall of the price. They predicted um, that the price were, should have uh, reached a lower level, but this actually didn't happen. It was the contrary. And so it's, it's, it's really difficult, I have to say, to, to, to make predictions, to make forecasts on this. But, I mean, we have a target, and this is for sure. So we want to have our top con technology matching the, the, the pair technology. So right now, the, we have a, a small gap. This is true. We made our investment. We renovate our machines. The, all the, the top code technology itself right now is uh, slightly more expensive. But our target is for 2023 to really make for utility scale, for residential, I mean, globally speaking, the top con uh, matching the price of per and replacing the per technology in terms of, I mean, products and in terms of price investment. That's our target. Yeah, can we achieve it? Uh, difficult to say, but yes, we are confident. Okay, 
Uh, confidence is good and targets are important, particularly in a climate context. Um, Adurne, bringing you back into the discussion, talking cost and price. Um, price discussions is every analyst's favorite discussion over the last couple of years. Um, I, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> I won't put you on the spot, Adene, but I will ask, you know, there's, there's this 2023 target for Jinko with their to Topcon technology. You're, you're, you said that you expect the, the switch from, from P-type to N-type to occur relatively quickly. What are your cost models pointing to in terms of when will N-type kind of cross that Rubicon and become um, cost competitive and therefore the majority or the, or the predominant technology? Well, that's a challenging question, especially after uh, Roberto's comments. But uh, our in-house view is that uh, it really depends on which type of N-type technology we are talking about. So, for instance, in the case of AJT, um, since it requires completely new equipment uh, lines and the capex are much higher, um, we do forecast the price gap to continue uh, existing. However, uh, we expect this price gap to uh, reduce uh, uh, quite quickly in the next uh, couple of years. And this will be, this is true for all uh, N-type technologies, uh, HIT, Topcon, uh, IBC, et cetera. In the case of Topcon, uh, because uh, you know, right now we are talking already about a quite a small price gap between uh, PERC and Topcon, of course, this reduction can be um, more quickly and uh, and maybe, you know, as, as uh, Roberto was mentioning, to reach this target of, of parity. What, what, is, what is certain is that customers are going to get more value out of this, you know, a similar price level uh, uh, from, from next year. And I think this is very good news for, for the industry. Uh, however, I think uh, it's, worth to, um, it's worth to highlight that, you know, there are some issues that might arise. Uh, which is, for instance, related to the BOM, the bill of materials between uh, PERC technologies or PERC mode uh, cells and N-type cells. And I think uh, somebody uh, before mentioned is quite different. You have a higher consumption of silver and, and you know, you have a much higher uh, wafer to cell processing costs, etc. So, you know, there are some potential uh, bottlenecks uh, that, you know, we need to be aware of and, and, be, and be cautious and follow very closely. Okay, thank you, Adene. Uh, well, Adene, you, you mentioned their silver, um, and, and I think there are still some concerns on the manufacturability side with, with these N-type models, modules. Uh, uh, George, how, how important is it to find a solution to, well, to silver consumption, first of all? Yeah, silver is, um, is a time bomb for all PV, and not just top uh, because all the technologies now are using a lot of silver. And Eunice uh, W, Brett Hallam, and his team have, uh, has, have done uh, great work on highlighting and putting the methodology together to tackle with um, <coughs> sustainable PV. So we, we need to reduce or get rid of silver if possible, uh, maybe with plating, copper plating, or other technologies. Um, now, Topcon uses more silver than PERC, and Hydro Junction uses way more silver than, than PERC. So th these are fundamental uh, limits, and it's not easy to reduce silver. So I'm a bit skeptical on how fast Topcon can reduce the gap with respect to a perk, just because of the silver problem. Uh, it's not it's not easy to to, to solve. And just uh, how much more silver? What's what, what's the ballpark for the additional silver um, consumption that's needed for the metallization of Topcon and, and then heterojunction? You said much more, and then more. It's is there a I think it's, figure? It's, it's double for uh, interjunction. Um, and then 25% uh, for Topcon, yeah, that was yeah. my understanding. For, for, for Topcon, yeah. yeah. So that, 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 that brings immediately around 0.6 or 0.7 cents per watt. Yeah, So it's a non-trivial. That, that's fair. I mean, you have to do something to, to get rid of that. That's not easy. Yeah. Because you, you have to use silver. With PERC, they're using aluminum. Problem solved. You yeah. Do that yeah, so in some ways, the transition to N-type is just an incremental increase. In some ways, this is, these are mature technology, technologies, but in other ways, it is a step change. Um, it, is a, it is a rather big shift for the industry. Yeah, and uh, sustainability and cost are intent to intertwined in a sense. So the industry, uh, if we're looking at uh, a few terawatt per year by the end of the decade, some say one, one to three 
this is the range that is being discussed in just eight years from now, annual installations, then all the numbers are very different. We're talking about uh, an order of magnitude, higher production. So every single uh, material that is being uh, used in the PV modules is important. Silver is one of them. Indium is also another material that's important, hydrojection and bismuth and so on. Uh, silver is by far the biggest problem. Uh, we have to do something about it, the whole industry. Okay, including, that's... including if we, even if we had PERC, we still had to do something. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, well, that's an important kind of message. Looking forward um, to finish on um, high efficiency, of course, is important for all the rest of the resource consumption, whether, whether it's land or, or aluminium for the frames and, and these kind of things. Um, well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for the discussion today. I think that was a really interesting discussion as to the future of N-Type and high efficiency here in Europe. Nicolas Schuller, a partner at Everose, Roberto Moggioni from Ginkgo Sol Solar, George Talupas from C. EA and Adurna Zocco from IHS Market. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, I think that is a great place to leave things for today. Thank you once again to all of our speakers in this session, to those behind the scenes, and to all of you for joining us today. Still lots more to come uh, in our In PV Magazine roundtables today. Two more sessions this afternoon. We'll be looking into Europe's PPA markets and then at business models for both green hydrogen and energy storage in combination with solar. Next up, we'll take a short break, during which you have the chance for some speed networking or to meet some of the speakers and sponsors in our expo area. At 12 midday, CEST will be ready to kick off the next session, in which we'll be sticking with the module technology topic and looking into design choices, revenue expectations, and reliability. Stay with us.